Good evening and welcome to the first ever Jewish Center dinner taking place both in person and in the comfort of your living room. We're honored that you've joined us. We're here because there's so much to celebrate and so much to which we look forward. In thinking about this moment, it doesn't feel like an exaggeration to say that we're living in a time of miracles. Looking back on the cataclysm and calamities of last spring, who could have predicted that so many of us would be sitting here today, vaccinated, mask-free, enjoying one another's company on a beautiful summer day in New York City? Baruch shechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu l'azman hazeh. And yet one of the enduring messages of Sefer Bamidbar is that miracles don't generate durable commitment. The Israelites that bore witness to the 10 plagues, to the splitting of the Red Sea, to Revelation itself, were the self-same Israelites who would earn a special place in Jewish history among our most prominent skeptics and complainers. They would have felt right at home in our shul. It's not enough to live through a miracle. All of us need a sense of purpose and a sense of community. When they build the Mishkan, when they encircle the mountain to hear the voice of Hashem, when they cross the Jordan and march into the Promised Land, that's when the Jewish people set aside their grievances. That's when the miracles remind them of the heights to which they ought to aspire. In an age of miracles, the Jewish center has been our touchstone, the community upon which we could depend for a sense of hope and a sense of aspiration, the place where we could open and nourish both our hearts and minds. It's the center in which we could come together both virtually and in person to actualize our ambitions and help make a difference in such unsettled times. You know, one of the refrains that I heard so often this year had to do with the indispensability of shul life. Rabbi, one member said to me more than once, Rabbi, I don't know how people function without a shul. I've barely been in the building, but I don't think I could have made it through the year without my beloved Jewish Center family. To live in an age of miracles is to know that each of us might just be capable of something miraculous. Now, Andrew is in charge of thank yous, but it's appropriate to take a beat and express our hakaras hatov to the people who have contributed so much to these miraculous times. I'm thinking of Aaron and Saba and our professional staff and our COVID committee who gave us Yamim Narayim on 87th Street, Megillah in the Park, and a pop-up vaccination site. I'm thinking of Sarah and our parent volunteers who gave us a youth Haggadah, outdoor youth groups, and Teen Minion. I'm so excited to welcome Chazen Green, whose beautiful voice carried us through so many difficult days. I'm thinking of Rabbi Buchler and Ora and Rabbi Rabinovich, who brought us so many outstanding opportunities to engage in Talmud Torah. And I'm thinking of our fabulous volunteers who organized phone calls and package deliveries, who ran our Yoval events and chaired our committees, who learned with us and davened with us online, who arranged meals for Shiva homes or new parents. Andrew and Mark and all of our outstanding officers are so deserving of our thanks. They always put in so much time and energy to lead our shul this year. I can't tell you how many late night calls and Zooms we had to make to sh make sure that we crossed every T and dotted every I. Our goal was to do everything possible to make sure that every person who walked through our doors would feel safe and comfortable and that every person not coming to shul could still feel included. Finally, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and bid farewell to Batsheva. For nine years, she's been a source of stability and reliability in our office, behind the website and our flyers and our Facebook page and our WhatsApp group. She's made it all happen. Now the 1,100 families, the young Israel of Woodmere, will be the beneficiaries of all of her talents. Batsheva, thank you for everything you've given to the Jewish Center. We wish you Tzeschem l'shalom. If Torah and Chesed and Tzedakah and social action are the cars on our train, Daily Minion is the engine that drives our train. When we reopened after the lockdown, scraping together a Minion became something of a challenge. A lot of people had left the city. A lot of people were uncomfortable venturing out. And we lost members to COVID. I want to pause to remember Alex Klein, who would often daven with us at Mincha, and Rabbi Mati Katz, who was such a regular at our 8 a.m. Shachris. And yet every day, rain or shine, our minion makers have been there to hold up our shul. Some of them were regulars before the pandemic, and some of them just stepped up, because that's what the moment demanded. In particular, 
want to acknowledge two teenagers, each of whom celebrated his bar mitzvah during the pandemic, Akiva Levine and Mayor Prager. You're at Minyan all the time. I'm sure it must have had something to do with your parents, but kol kavod on your exemplary commitment to tefillah b'tzibur. As the Talmud says, to daven in shul is to be a good neighbor. To judge by the people we honor tonight, we live in a great neighborhood. It's my pleasure now to introduce our minion makers. What is a shul without a minion? When our shul closed a year and a half ago, we no longer could come together to this spiritual center. That was the challenge that we faced, and our minion makers were those individuals to ensure that we had a lifeline to this community every single day. Was it easy to get minyanim? In the very beginning, it was quite challenging. In those early months when the minion reopened, um, we didn't get a minion often. We had so many times uh, where we were able to call people, you know, up and down 86th Street, uh, anybody to come, text them. We had a couple groups um, on WhatsApp. Because people of a certain age weren't allowed back into minion, and uh, people of a very young age had gone off to their parents' houses, there weren't that many people to make minion. And so when the minion opened, you know, they needed bodies. The first time I came to Minyan, uh, that was an experience. Um, I was nervous. I uh, tried to sit as far away as everyone in the room as possible. Um, it was nerve-wracking. I remember it was a very hot and muggy day as well. We did it in the social hall downstairs. That was before we came back. Um, it felt uh, almost a bit like kabuki theater because we really had to follow these very strict rules about where to stand, how far apart to stand, how masked we needed to be. I was sad because I didn't get, uh, there's a lot of people I only know from Shul and I only got to see when I come to Shul. It was a very artificial feeling in some sense, but it was also a feeling of that this was necessary, this was important in the communal life of so many people in our neighborhood. <laughs> Coming back was really emotional. I sat like in the back row and I was just like kind of taking it all in. Our center had been desolate for so many months, just months even, but it felt like a lifetime. And being back here really you know, was that feeling, uh, you know, that, that Hashem is with us. During the course of the year, we ended up having not only people saying Kaddish and having yard site, but we had kids who put on tefillin for the first time and kids who had an aliyah for the first time you know, all with 10, 11 people in the room. It built a kind of small community within a community. People who I had seen before, now in such a small knit group, you know, welcoming me, introducing themselves, and getting to know them in a more intimate way um, was just really nice. It was weirdly powerful. Praying in a small minyan made me feel very bonded in a way that felt, in a way, more profound than sometimes the, the friendly bonds of being together and enjoying someone's company. Being with a group of people um, with a common goal and you know, davening together, there's something like really unifying about that and, and losing that was, was really painful. So kind of coming to the realization about how important meaning was to me allowed me then to you know, want to do it all the more so. More than we made the minyan, the minyan makes us. The kids are always watching. And so I think for all of us, people on the vaccine task force and on the opening committee, and people came to davening and people who did all sorts of stuff, we need to model that behavior so they, so they learn. So when they're in our position, they do the same thing. When we call ourselves the Jewish Center, what we're really conveying is a sense that we're here, embedded in this Jewish community. It really conveys who we are. What a beautiful tribute to an outstanding group of people. You know, one of the highlights of this past year was the opportunity to daven together virtually. Our davening was often led by the beautiful voice of our new chazan, Jonathan Green. Please join me in welcoming him as he performs a special song for us this evening. Shalom 
to the Jewish Center community, the members attending in person and virtually, it's great to be with you tonight. Thank you for coming. Tonight I'll sing for you a song composed by Rav Shlomo Karlbach and also sung by Eitan Katz to the words from the Modim prayer in Shmona Esrei. Hatov ki lo chalu rachamecha v'hamrachein ki lo tamu chasadecha me'ulam ki vinulach. Will we praise God for his goodness, for his compassion that always shines through and that we will always place our hope and faith in Hashem. Please join me in prayer, a prayer of thanks to Hashem for his goodness and his compassion and to those members of the shul that were agents of Hashem's kindness. Thank you, Chazen. Please welcome now the chair of our spectacular dinner, the amazing Tehillah Blech. Thank you, Rabbi. It is truly a momentous occasion to be here together tonight in a way that last year seemed impossible to even fathom. This shul and this community are so essential to so many of us. Finding a way to celebrate our rich history and the role our clergy and our heroic membership has played in these challenging times has been a real joy to produce. Our honorees exemplified the dual virtues we hold so dear, Torah Umada. Here's a special look at what the Jewish Center means to all of us. It's a hard question to ask why a synagogue endures. I think what most people are looking for generally was a, a sense of belonging. You know, that was one of the worst things I think about the pandemic is that so many people, you know, were left on their own. There are so many shuls across this country, but the Jewish Center as a synagogue that's been here for over a century is something uh, that's really inspiring and something that connects, I think, every member of our community. When this institution was conceived of uh, and built, it was a kind of radical uh, idea, an institution that at once was deeply, deeply committed to uh, tradition and at the same time be progressive and be forward-thinking. That's, uh, that's a tall order, but we have a hundred years behind us and hundreds, uh, hundreds ahead of us. The Jewish Center is really, it's our family's second home. It's our, it's our home away from home. And this last year has been exceptionally difficult to be away from this space. A lot that I missed about being in the center. I missed row D and E. Remember going up for Kiddush and the kids lining up for Kiddush. Um, and Havdalah. And Havdalah. The thing I really missed was hearing the rabbis 
Drasha. I suppose I should say the prayers are what I miss most, but I, I really did miss the people. Going to groups with Kira and Julia throughout the year, that's what I really miss. Thank God we have Kiddush back. It's an amazing opportunity to be able to share and to speak with others um, more so than you do on the little screens. You realize after all we've been through and all the difficult times that we've had, like seeing people, it's a true blessing. I appreciated it more than I ever had. And I think I always will. There's nothing like being able to see someone in shul, give them a hug, and just hear how their week was. It was uh, all-encompassing. We missed a lot. It's been a really challenging year in a lot of ways, um, but the way we've been there for one another uh, is what, to me, has always made this place special, and it really stood out this year. I missed not being here. This shul is my home. You know, when all of this is over, one of the chapters from this pandemic saga that will stay with us is an improbable story. When Governor Cuomo announced in January that New Yorkers over the age of 75 would be eligible for the vaccine, it was clear there were going to be people who would need help getting vaccinated. And it soon became clear that almost everyone would need help. The system was convoluted and counterintuitive. Navigating it required not only technical savvy, but patience, resourcefulness, and more patients. I knew there was one person to call. Before I could even explain my idea, Jessica had already identified the challenge, understood that it require countless hours of work, and she'd already said yes. Overnight, she had assembled a committee and established a system to find appointments for our members. But of course, once word got out that our Cracker Jack volunteers were so successful at helping people get vaccinated, non-members started calling too. We weren't about to turn anyone away. Out of curiosity, the committee would typically ask, tell us, how did you hear about our committee? Usually someone would mention the name of a member or a friend of a member or a friend of a friend. One woman who called was a total stranger and Jessica asked her, oh, you know, tell me, how, how did you hear about us? And the woman said, I got your number from Helen Rosenthal's office. The city government was referring callers to our task force. Every time eligibility expanded to include another age group or another set of New Yorkers, our volunteers were there to help. Chaya ran a Zoom to train volunteers on best practices. They shared every new piece of information that might be helpful. They drove people to their appointments. They followed up with them to make sure there wasn't a cancellation. It was an expression of chesed in its most consummate sense. I was reminded of what the Rambam writes about ransoming captives. He says, There is no greater mitzvah than to help release someone from captivity. With the pandemic raging and thousands dying every day, so many people were confined to their homes, separated from family and friends. To make the vaccine available at such a time was the fulfillment of the very highest form of tzedakah. It's little wonder that the story was picked up by the Jewish Week and the Wall Street Journal. It was a metaphor for the power of community, the power of volunteerism, the power of persistence. Now, every generation has its challenge. What a tribute to our leadership and to our membership to be able to look back and say, not only did we meet the challenge, we rose with the occasion and performed a series of chasadim, the proportions of which won't be fully able to be appreciated for many years. To Jessica and the extraordinary members of our COVID task force, your contribution to the well-being of our community will not soon be forgotten. Thank you for modeling for us how to perform a mitzvah rabbah. Thank you for modeling for us how to be great Jewish Center members and how to be great Jews. It's my pleasure now to introduce our COVID task force. One of the things I love about the Jewish Center is our commitment to chesed. And when there's an opportunity that arises, they step up, as they did throughout the pandemic, and in particular with the COVID vaccine task force. I was frantically one night trying to set up appointments for vaccine, and um, there was nothing. We started to call furiously 
um, go online and try to get uh, an appointment. And same thing, we struck out time and time again. I tried getting my own appointments on my own, um, in between working and doing everything else, sitting on the computer and going to a couple of different sites that would even possibly allow me to register in advance. And that didn't work. I had struggled finding an appointment. I had received an Instagram DM from Phyllis and said, I'm happy to help you or anybody else that needs help getting an appointment. Throughout the pandemic, Rabbi Levine sent daily messages about hope and inspiration, checking on people, thinking of people, letting us know that we were in his thoughts. And when the time came, he focused his message on the vaccine. And the Jessica Gross, Hani Siegel, Phyllis Roth, and lots of others heeded the call. If someone needed an appointment, they reached out to Jessica or someone on the committee, and that person went to work. They were constantly refreshing screens, looking for other places that you could get vaccines, seeing if there were standby lists that they could get people on. As time went by, they put together a website so that um, people could access it, not just members of the shul, but people, people in the broader community can figure out how they could navigate the system. So it really required a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of commitment. We would sign them up as quickly as we could. Usually within, a, like I would say, within the day. I think it got really funny when like, I would get random texts from strangers. Um, that was always great, <laughs> because you're just like, I don't know how you got my number, I don't know how word got out, um, but that was always like really funny. It was funny, because I would hear sort of the, yes, I got that appointment, or the, and then I, you know, I, I won't fill in the word that was said there, I can't believe I just missed that. Um, but uh, there was definitely a sense of urgency, um, a sense of, uh, of importance and a sense of uh, you know, making sure that she could get as many of those appointments scheduled as possible. What I also thought was beautiful was the fact that it wasn't limited just to the membership. The Jewish Center has always uh, been a leader on a national and international level um, in the Jewish community and beyond. And it was uh, another example of uh, reaching out beyond the walls of the membership and assisting uh, anyone who needed it. Like, it truly felt like saving lives. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, and it felt like a really good, concrete way to help out with, with, a, with a true tragedy that we're dealing with. You know, anything you could do to help people could get, to get vaccinated and have this not happen to, I think was very meaningful. It just felt so right and natural for us to be a part of helping people get their vaccine. So when I got the email that we were having a pop-up vaccine site in the Jewish Center, my heart skipped a beat. Walking into this building for the first time, getting to have the first shot of the day with Rabbi Levine taking my picture and essentially having rabbinic supervision was one of the most meaningful and emotional moments of my life. My fingers literally shook with excitement just knowing that I'd be able to receive this miracle of medicine in the place that I consider my second home. What was so nice about being involved in the vaccine task force was that it really, you know, there was like a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't think I had ever experienced um, anything in a, in a, on a Jewish communal level that felt so uh, powerful. It's an incredible feeling of community. We know that firsthand from our own experience, and certainly in, in these times, it's a real sense of family. I would love to just say thank you. It really meant a lot. Such a relief, and I was so grateful. It was like some kind of a miracle. I owe my life, literally, to the Jewish Center and the COVID task force. Thank you. What an inspiring reminder of just how much this shul and this community mean to all of us. Please join me now in welcoming the president of the Jewish Center, Mr. Andrew Bordek. Good evening. For all of you who have missed seeing the top hat in the morning suit, here it is. Wow, this is a lot more comfortable. What a difference a year makes. At this time last year, our building was closed, our dinner took place virtually, and it had been more than five months since the last recitation of Shachrit in our sanctuary. And here we are today. Many of us gathered together to celebrate in person for tonight's event, joined virtually by many others. 
And that's to Minyanim. Some 200 people are now davening with us on a typical Shabbat morning. And we have even been able to bring back Kiddush. I think it's safe to say that while this past year has certainly been a challenging one, the Jewish Center rose to the occasion, above and beyond, and persevered. And I am confident that in the weeks and months ahead, we will continue our upward trajectory. Allow me to recap some highlights of the past year. Tefillah. During the height of the pandemic, we introduced many opportunities for online tefillah, including weekly Kabbalat Shabbat and Havdalah services, as well as Halal and Rosh Chodesh and Yizker before the Chagim. Most of these were led by John Green, who we are excited to welcome to our community as our new Chazan. We had nearly 400 people attend our eight indoor and outdoor minyanim over Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in a meaningful and safe environment. And of course, our Women's Tehillim group continued to meet regularly to daven for the well-being of our family, friends, and members of our community. Perhaps this year, these tefillot were needed more than ever. Thank you in particular to Joyce White's Gold Arena Rothman and Naomi Goldman. Torah study. We continue to grow spiritually and intellectually through the thoughtful and thought-provoking daily messages from Rabbi Levine, through five-minute Zoom Divrei Torah and his daily written miss missives during much of the pandemic. We significantly expanded opportunities for online learning offered by our remarkable clergy. Indeed, classes that previously attracted smaller groups now regularly have 50 or more people in attendance, including team talk class classes throughout the year covering the books of the Nevim from Yehoshua through Yechezkel. Civic and communal leadership. We hosted a discussion of the homeless crisis in New York City, held a community event with local police chiefs, and more recently hosted a city council candidate forum moderated by Rabbi Buchler in advance of the upcoming local elections. We also launched our Yovo program, Year of Very Active Listening, exploring issues of race in our country and our community, with the capstone event being the Rudin Lecture delivered by Governor Deval Patrick. Thank you to Ora Weinbach and Virginia Bear Hurt for organizing this year's program and all the members of the Yovel committees. Finally, social programming. Our youth department, led by Sarah Cromwell, remained active, including a magic show, Mishloch Manot packaging, and a tour of Shoshana Comet's tapestries led by Ted Comet. And more recently, the return of Shabbat morning groups and our teen minion. We had another trivia night hosted by Len Berman. We had a wine tasting event, a whiskey and chocolate tasting event, and a cooking class with Adina Sussman, all coordinated by Grant Silverstein and Dina Burkat. Finally, there was a wonderful virtual tour of the Frick Museum in tribute to the memory of Mindy Lamb, organized by our sisterhood. Thank you to Rachel Lurie, Rachel Ringler, Gilda Chodish, and Rachel Levine. Let me conclude with a few thank yous. First, thank you to tonight's honorees, the minion makers and the members of our vaccine task force who represent our community's core values of tefillah and chesed. My deep gratitude to Tehillah Blech for chairing tonight's event, which is a hybrid in-person and virtual event made it at least twice as complicated as a typical dinner. But you, together with the under, other wonderful members of the committee, Panina Blazer, Rebecca Ice, Naomi Goldman, Grant Silverstein, and, and Rachel Wolf, have made it a tremendous success. Thank you. As you know, our dinner is one of the most important fundraising events of the year. It is no surprise that this year, more than ever, that this is even more true, especially in light of the financial challenges we are facing from the shortfall, especially in our rental income. I am so thankful to all of you for your generous support and especially the members of our One Gift program. I also want to thank those who ensure our safety and security. First, the members of our COVID Advisory Committee who have watched out for our health this year. Rabbi Levine, Steve Graber, Aliza Hertzberg, Barbara Paris, David Revis, Mark Siegel, Zeb Williams, and Lori Zeltzer. And second, the members of CSS, who in all manner of weather stand watch to ensure our security. In that regard, a special thanks to Steve Graber, Jeffrey Smith, and Ruby Gottlieb. Thank you to our clergy, professional staff, and office staff. In particular, thank you to Rabbi Buchler for everything he has done this year and for getting the young leadership minion up and running again as many young people return to the city. Also, a special thank you to Aaron Strum for the tremendous job he does day in and day out. The past year has been especially challenging. 
and he has risen to meet those challenges each and every day. And of course, let me express my gratitude to Rabbi Levine for his leadership, his partnership, and his friendship, more so than ever during this past year. Finally, acharon acharon chaviv. Rachel, you are my rock. Words cannot express my appreciation and awe for everything you do for our family, our friends, and community. Let me simply say thank you, and I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's presentation. The Jewish Center would like to acknowledge our amazing sponsors who made tonight such an enormous success. <laughs> Can it all?